everyone's uh, joining in. All right, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. I wanna thank you for joining today's uh, press conference call. Uh, my name is Timmy with Congressman Kildee's office, and I'll be the moderator uh, for today's press call. We're first gonna hear remarks from each representative, and then we're gonna take questions at the end for 20 minutes. And uh, also this call is gonna be recorded, so uh, for media and staff, if you need uh, the call after, I can definitely get that to you. Um, and then also uh, at the end of the call, I'm gonna be doing a Q&A. Um, so if you, uh, if you need, um, to ask a question. Uh, if you look down at the reaction section, there'll be a moment, there'll be a button where you can uh, raise your hand. And if you don't see that um, in a moment, I'm going to put some instructions um, in the chat and it's going to list out how you can uh, essentially ask a question and uh, what buttons uh, you can press to do that. So, um, so um, we're going to get started here. And uh, Congressman Kildee, I'll uh, hand it over to you for remarks. Uh, thanks, Ro Timmy, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, later today at 1 p.m., Congress will convene in a joint session to certify the results of the Electoral College, including Michigan's 16 electoral I don't see So we don't know right now whether Michigan will be contested, but here's what we do know. Two weeks from today, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be sworn in as President of the United States uh, of America. Uh, they won Michigan's electoral votes they won well over the number of electoral votes needed to win this election. Unfortunately, some Republicans in both the House and the Senate have announced that they will object to certain state certifications during the joint session today. Again, we don't know the exact states will be objected to. Many of the uh, specula uh, speculations we've heard, and of course, a lot of comments by members of the House and Senate indicate that they have raised questions about Michigan. Uh, so our state delegation, uh, has been working over the last couple of days uh, so that if Republicans object to our electoral votes, we will be ready to defend our state's election on the House floor, an election which was free, safe, and secure. So here are the facts. On November 3rd, Michigan voters elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to be the next president and vice president of the United States. It was not even close. President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris won Michigan by over 154,000 votes, 14 times Donald Trump's 2016 margin. So despite an ongoing pandemic, which obviously affected uh, all of this, this was the most well-run election in our state system. More Michiganders voted than ever before. In total, five and a half million Michiganders voted, including 3.3 million Michiganders who mailed their ballots prior to election day following the 2018 referendum that enshrined the right for all voters to vote by mail-in absentee ballot in our state constitution, a decision made by the people of Michigan. There's no evidence of widespread voter fraud or irregularities in Michigan's election. But don't just take it from us. Republican city, township, and county clerks across the state have all canvassed their results and said that Michigan conducted a safe and secure election. The Michigan Board of Canvassers, made up of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, certified the election. Michigan leaders in the state legislature, including Lee Chatfield and Mike Shirky, uh, Shirky, virtually all of these leaders, by the way, who supported President Trump's campaign, have all said there is no credible evidence of voter fraud. Even President Trump's own Department of Justice said they did not find any evidence of widespread voter fraud. So the, the, the case is clear, the evidence is clear. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won Michigan's 16 electoral college votes. Despite no evidence of wrong, wrongdoing, however, some of our Republican colleagues today could still object to Michigan's certification. And in doing so, they would attempt to overturn an election and disenfranchise millions of Michigan voters who cast their ballots on election day. The irony, of course, is not lost to us. Now, some members of Congress who may object were also on the ballot in the same election. And as they continue to sow doubt in Michigan's election results when it comes to the presidential election, they have no issue taking their own oath of office just a few days ago. 
They can't have it both ways. Thankfully, though, some, hopefully many Republicans, but we know some will join us today to defend our democracy. This shouldn't be a question. This is so much bigger than a political fight between Democrats and Republicans. This is about the foundation of our democracy. Every member of Congress must find the courage, the will to do the right thing and oppose this undemocratic attempt to overturn the results of Michigan's and the United States free, safe and secure election. So with that, um, I'll turn now to Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, who will join us and we will take it from their members passing it on to the next member. And Brenda joined us, so. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, so we'll, rather than go to uh, Congresswoman Dingell, we'll go to Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. Brenda. Hello everyone, I'm Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence from the Michigan 14th District, which includes Detroit and Wayne County, the famous Wayne County that you've heard so much about. We saw a record-breaking number of Michiganders vote in this presidential election, more than 5 million people throughout the state. And over the month, over this past month, I've watched in complete shock and, and lack of understanding why the President Trump and his allies have filed numerous lawsuits seeking to overturn the results of this election, including my home state in Michigan. Trump and his allies are pushing a dangerous, un-American conspiracy theory that has absolutely no evidence and a widespread fraud. You know, one of the allegations is that President Trump has said without merit that more people voted in Detroit than there are people. That could not be true. That, and he said that I won Michigan. He continues to say that. But according, you know, we are in the position of producing the facts. And according to the facts, Detroit election results was just over 250,000, of which there were 500,000 registered Detroiters. And this roughly is about a 50% voter turnout. I, I come here saying that this is personal to me. Being a black woman in America, I was raised by my grandparents who migrated from the South. I am a descendant of an emancipated slave. And my grandmother, I sat at her knee during the civil rights movement with tears rolling down her eyes. When we were watching hoses, water hoses being sprayed and, and people being beaten and dogs being sicked on individuals who just wanted the right to vote. I was a little girl and I remember marching in my middle school when Martin Luther King was killed. Voter suppression is real and is personal to me and people of color. This history has a very, very scarred memory of suppressing the vote of minorities in America. I want you to know that this disenfranchisement of people of color that's happened around this country, think of the states that are being targeted. There are states that have large cities and pockets of minority voters. I know just like my hometown of Detroit and Wayne County, the president and his lawyers have repeatedly said that we did not have an election that would not have elected him and has attacked us lawsuit after lawsuit. And for me, this suppression tactic is one that I've seen throughout history to su suppress the vote and the voice of minorities in America. It reminds me of Jim Crow, throwing out legitimate votes of black Americans. We cannot go down that slippery slope. I want everyone here to know that we had a safe, secure, and accessible election. We work closely with our Secretary of State, and I'm proud of the people who voted. The thing that we're fighting for is not for Democratic votes. We're fighting for the votes of every single person in Michigan. And come January 20th, Joe Biden, Jr., 
and Kamala Harris will be our president and vice president of these United States of America. Thank you. And now I will yield to another fighter and a woman that I admire, my Congresswoman for the state of Michigan, Debbie Dingell. Thank you, Brenda. You know, we're with you this morning and we're here on this historic date uh, on the same week that we all took our oath of office and pledged to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So I, I first want to talk to you to me, talk to you about what democracy means to me and why today is so very important. You know, I, I can't help, anybody who knows me knows that I miss John a lot. And I've been thinking as we've been going through these, this, the last few weeks, first of all, I'd love to see what he would be tweeting right now. But I think of his friendship with George Bush of more than 50 years. And that was a friendship that was made in the halls of Congress, in meetings, talking about policy issues, and probably bonded when they played racquetball several times a week. But they were of a political generation that understood that delivering for the American people was more important than a political win for each other's parties. They knew that good government and good public policy helped guide the success of hardworking men and women across the country of all parties. They were Americans. George Bush made that abundantly clear in the note that he left President Clinton on inauguration day after he had been defeated by Bill Clinton. You will be our president when you read this note. Your success is now our country's success. I will be rooting hard for you. I don't wanna speak for either John or for President George Bush. Wouldn't you like to know what they're saying up there? I don't wanna get up there right now, but I, and I do know they're up there by the way. But I believe if they were here today, they would tell us to remember that we, the people, are entrusted with, with the power to restore this great nation to common ground rather than keep attacking the fundamental pillars of our democracy. You know, and I, when you look at Michigan, I want to talk about the bipartisan support that there is no evidence that there was any kind of fraud in Michigan. The president call, called our two Republican state legislative leaders to the White House. They listened to the case that was made and they issued a statement in a very objective way. They had not been made aware of any information that would change the outcome of the election in Michigan. And Senator Shirky, uh, Majority Leader Senator Shirky, the le leader of the Senate, said at a Senate Oversight Committee that we had not received evidence of fraud on a scale that would change the outcome of the election in Michigan. President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris won Michigan's political election. The Vice Chair of Michigan's Board of Canvassers, a Republican, a young man, was observed at that hearing when they approved it, that certified it, that we have a clear legal duty to certify the results of the election as shown by the returns that were given to us. We cannot and should not go beyond that. As John Adams once said, we are a government of laws, not men. My, our colleague, Paul Mitchell, left the Republican party over some of these issues in the last few weeks and said, it's unacceptable for political candidates to treat our election system as though we were a third world nation and incite distrust of something so basic as to the sanctity of our vote. And this week, Senator Shirky said he was gonna to continue to study the issue. Our secretary of state, she's gonna work with him. But he also said, we haven't, discovered, we haven't discovered anything that would cause me to take that kind of dramatic action in Michigan to reverse the elections. And he does both, he is committed. He said, it's on me and he's gonna work with Jocelyn. Let's look at the AV votes. Let's look at the increase. Are there things, I'm gonna use my old GM word, we can do to continuously improve. So I just wanna say that um, if they're not gonna be successful today, even, but, I want people to really reflect on 
that while they won't be successful in overturning the election, they may succeed in creating an unrelenting crack in the foundation upon which our American democracy is built. And we all need to take that very seriously. And with that, I want to turn this over to my, uh, I'm going to use the word sister. I already got accused of calling somebody uh, sister today. Uh, she's my sister, but a very effective member of Congress, Alyssa Slapkin. Thank you, Representative Dingell. Um, thanks to everyone for being here. So you've heard my colleagues talk about the efficacy of the elections in Michigan, and we stand prepared. We've been meeting and working together, um, ready to rebut um, any claim that our election was not uh, free and fair and uh, provable. And that for us hinges on the security of the election. Frankly, Michigan is a state that has a paper ballot. Um, we have redundancy and transparency. That is why in places like Antrim County, we were able to hold a bipartisan hand count um, of these places that were uh, under question. Um, and um, so I don't think there's any, uh, you know, credible um, claim that our elections weren't fair. And that's why eight lawsuits um, were rejected because they did not have a, a basis in fact. And what I've really seen, I think we've all seen in Michigan and, and Congresswoman Dingell alluded to it is a lot of real heroism on the ground, frankly, from a lot of local officials who never thought that they would be put in this situation. Um, many of our elected clerks in my district, Michigan's eighth district, we have 54 clerks. The vast majority of them are card carrying Republican clerks who never uh, imagined that they would be in the spotlight like this. Certainly people like Tina Barton, who is the clerk of Rochester Hills, who came under fire, um, Cheryl Guy in Antrim County, who stood by the letter of the law um, and did what many of our colleagues here in Congress were not able to do, which is to say very clearly, regardless of what their party was pushing, they stood up for democracy in a way that was clear um, and uh, meaningful. And we thank them for their role in preserving Amer uh, Michigan's elections. Um, I will just tell you as a national security person, for me, what's happening today, an important piece um, of our democracy, an important step in our democracy, requires just a little bit of context. Um, um, I will tell you as someone who came into the national security world because I happened to be in New York City on 9-11 and felt that it was my job to protect and defend the United States, that right now the division that is going on in our country is the single biggest threat to our national security. Um, and it outweighs any threat from a foreign terrorist organization, from Russia, from China, external threat. And that is a real shift for me. Um, that to me signals the end of the 20 years of the post 9-11 era. And as we are all sitting here, we can hear the protests going on on the plaza. I walked through them this morning on my way here. Many of the citizens of Michigan's 8th District are here protesting and exercising their right to do so. Um, but I think it's extremely important that we understand not just what this day means um, as a procedural matter, but what it, what it symbolizes in terms of our division and the work we have to do to come back together. We're gonna to continue the peaceful transition of power through the 20th of January. That is our responsibility and our right. Certainly, as Congresswoman Dingell said, we just took our oaths of office to protect and defend the constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. But then we have to figure out how to come together and live together as a nation. And I say this as one of the representatives of a Democratic representative of a Trump voting district. Um, if either side, Democrat or Republican, believes that we can just retreat to our own silos, our own media, and live in our own bubbles, we are all mistaken. Um, we are all Americans. We all live here together. Um, and for my colleagues um, in the Congress who feel they need to oppose either Michigan certification or uh, elections writ large, I urge them to, you know, instead of spreading misinformation and lies about the efficacy of this election, that actually join in something positive, join our Secretary of State who said she would lead a bipartisan review of our systems in Michigan. It can only be good to strengthen those systems. Um, and um, we, she will look at all of the things that people are concerned about. 
Um, but um, I feel this day acutely, the weight of it acutely, um, and the desperate need we have to address our divisions internally. We cannot be the country we are meant to be without addressing those divisions. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Congressman Levin. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Slotkin. Uh, and, you know, I want to add uh, to your uh, great words that in, of the clerks in my district, uh, most are in cities and they're non-partisan, uh, but the, we have three townships. All three had Republican clerks for the 2020 election. They did an outstanding job. Um, and uh, they stood up for our democratic process. And what we're really seeing today is not a procedural disagreement between Republicans and Democrats or a policy disagreement, the kind of thing that's common in democracy, almost constitution, constitutive of democracy. What we're seeing is something di different. We're witnessing an effort to leave the realm of democracy altogether and deny the votes of the people of Michigan and of other states in our nation. But you know what I want to do with the few minutes I have with you here is remind our Michigan media and share with our national media really a, a good news story about a healthy democracy getting healthier yet, our democracy in Michigan. In 2018, Michiganders debated a ballot initiative to make numerous changes to our state constitution to enhance our democratic processes. It was called Promote the Vote. It was Proposal 3 in 2018. And it was designed to help Michiganders participate in our democracy more easily. Um, and it had many measures, but it included allowing any registered voter to vote at home, to vote by absentee ballot. We adopted Proposal 3 on November 6, 2018, overwhelmingly by 67% to 33%. And in 2020, these improvements allowed Michigan to emerge as a national leader in voter participation and election integrity. Given that this election happened in a pandemic, the biggest public health crisis in 100 years, allowing voters to submit ballots via mail, via Dropbox, by voting in person early at their local clerk when there weren't big crowds, helped drive Michigan's huge turnout and safe election. On this issue of mail balloting, over 70% of Americans think all voters should be able to vote by mail if they want to. And today there are five states that do their elections completely by mail. Any suggestion that voting by mail is corrupt is absurd in the face of these states' successful use of it for virtually all of their citizens. Indeed, a study by the leading experts on voting by mail showed that its rate of fraud over two decades is six one hundred thousandth of one percent. <laughs> That's hard for me to even say correctly. For all intents and purposes, zero. So in May, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson partnered with local clerks to make sure all registered voters were mailed an absentee ballot application. Some people objected to this. It was litigated in Michigan courts and federal courts, and they stoutly supported her actions. Indeed, the controlling decision in Michigan said she was doing her duty to breathe life into the constitutional voting rights that we had overwhelmingly given ourselves two years earlier. And the results of Michigan voters' newly expanded right to vote safely at home or early at their clerk's offices are right there on paper, clear for all to see. Over two and a half times as many Michiganders voted absentee in 2020 as did in 2016. As Dan said, 3.3 million people. And they comprised a stunning 59.6% of the vote. 60% of voters voted absentee, breaking all records. And when the ballots were counted and recorded, no problem of any significance was found with these early ballots whatsoever. I can report with confidence that Michigan's expanded use of absentee voting contributed to our most secure election and our biggest turnout in years, 
and was a stunning success. Our very democracy depends on our willingness to protect our election that we just went through. And today, we're gonna proudly do it as Americans. Thank you, and now I yield to my esteemed colleague and neighbor, Haley Stevens, and just to keep this real, I'm gonna rib Haley and tell her, I got my books in our my bookcase before you did. <laughs> We both had to move offices. <laughs> but we're we're still different. waiting for the painter over I'm here, Andy. To, I'm looking, to, <laughs> looking forward to visiting you in your new office. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm honored to join my colleagues in their delivery of fact and their, their statements this morning. Um, unlike our, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, uh, you can see we are completely united in the integrity and historic nature of our election uh, and its outcome. And it, as we reflect in the middle of a pandemic uh, that posed significant challenges that claimed far too many lives of Michiganders, people showed up to vote and they showed up to vote in record number. Uh, they showed up to vote utilizing as the Dean of our delegation, Congressman Kildee reflected uh, through the absentee ballot process, 3.3 million Michiganders. And there's certainly nothing to be contested uh, about the integrity of our election in Michigan and its outcome. But one thing we know for certain is that the campaign to undermine our election began very early. And it came from the president of the United States who started to call into question the absentee ballots and the process in which people were getting their absentee ballots, not just encouraging people not to vote by absentee, but by claiming that absentee ballots wouldn't be valid. And they've carried that narrative through to the day that we find ourselves here in the United States Congress, January 6th, where some are fallaciously going to, to make the motion to say that our election shouldn't be certified. It is wholly unconscionable, it is wrong, and it is an insult to everyone who came out to vote in the state of Michigan. And our clerks, they certainly did do a, a, a great job. Our, our clerk in Livonia, Susan Nash, uh, Livonia is a, a city of, of 100,000. We had record voter turnout. And I'd like to read something that she said. She said, as a, as a nonpartisan clerk, I am proud of the work our team did this November. And I am confident that this is the most secure election uh, the city of Livonia has ever administered. I will continue to welcome and cooperate with any audit of our election results because I know this will only shed more light on the fact that Livonia residents can have a complete trust in their local election. You see, there are some people who want to purport falsehood so much. They'll say it over and over and over again with the hope that it becomes true. But the reality is it is still falsehood, my friends. So today we join together to defend our democracy, wholly united as a Michigan delegation here. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague uh, who is leading our press conference, Congressman Kildee, thank you. Thank you, Haley. And, and I'm sure as you all can see, we have a, a, an incredible uh, Michigan delegation. We would have been joined uh, also this morning uh, by Representative Rashida Tlaib, who's just feeling a bit under the weather, but she has been working with us over the last several days as this delegation has been preparing our defense on the floor of the House, if it's necessary, uh, of the Michigan, uh, ch of the potential challenge to the Michigan electoral votes. I, I want to turn to Rotimi in a moment to uh, open it up for questions, but I do want to underscore a point that I think really needs to be uh, so central to this. And Congresswoman Lawrence, led with this, and I know all of us feel this way, uh, Congresswoman Tlaib, I'm sure would have said this as well. It's hard to ignore the fact that Republicans who are leading this, and it's not all Republicans, there are many Republicans who will join with us, but those who are leading this, including the president, are targeting states and communities of color when they talk about the votes that they raise questions about. Their effort to disenfranchise those voters makes it very clear that today, members of the House and Senate are going to cast their votes. And when they cast those votes, 
they're going to choose which list they will be placed upon for all of history to examine. They have to choose, will they be on the list that includes our late and beloved colleague, John Lewis, who spent his whole life fighting for the right for people to cast their vote and have it counted. A list that includes Dr. Martin Luther King, Fannie Lou Hamer, Diane Nash, so many other heroes. Or are those members of the House and the Senate going to add their name permanently to the list that includes Orville Faubus, George Wallace, and Bull Connor? Today, they get to decide what list their name will be placed on in indelible ink for all of history to see. And with that, let me turn it back to Rotimi for questions. Thank you, boss. Um, we'll now be begin the question portion of the conference call. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can uh, raise you you can uh, raise your hand uh, sort of with the in the reaction section. You can press a button to raise your hand, and then uh, if you don't have that in the chat, I've listed instructions on how to do that. So um, first, we're going to go with uh, Jim Kaiser for WXYZ. Um, if you could unmute yourself, uh, feel free. Can you hear me all? Hey, yep. Jim. Here you go. Good morning, everyone. Um, a couple of questions. Let me start off with, um, I, I took some notes. Uh, Congressman Dingell, you uh, said, uh, and I didn't get your quote exactly, but I'm going to kind of ask you to backtrack and, and uh, do a little deeper dive on this, if you would. Um, you said that this will uh, create, if this is challenged and if somehow uh, unrailed, this, this would create an unrelenting crack in democracy. Um, I'm not sure if I'm precise on that, but what are you saying there? Uh, what are I the said that it would create an unrelenting crack. What am I saying? That, that the people that are participating in today are attacking the fundamental pillars of our constitution. I would, I, you know, I have never forgiven Tom Friedman for writing the uh, column, should General Motors go bankrupt, although he may have been right in the end. But he writes an, uh, an incredible op-ed today that I would bring to all of your attention. And he talks about, quite frankly, those that are undertaking this are not loyal to the United States of America and the harm that they are doing to our government. You know, people's, we, this country has been divided by fear and hatred. I think that the most, the serious danger that is coming out of what is happening is that people do not believe that their elections, they're not believing in the credibility and the integrity of our elections. And one of the, it, it, one of the most critical things since the very beginning of when our democracy was founded was the peaceful and orderly transition of government when the people speak. And Republicans today don't like the outcome of the election and they'll accept it when they like the outcome, which is part of what Tom Friedman says. But if they don't like it, they're just gonna make up their, old rule, their own rules. And we are a nation of laws. And th this is a very, very dangerous precedent that is fundamentally attacking people's confidence in their government and that their vote matters, is counted, and when they elect somebody that they've really been elected. It's about credibility and integrity. Okay, we have others. Jim, you have another question? Yeah, I have a follow-up. So having said that, and uh, any members of Congress who want to address this one, having said that, what does the Vice President need to do today? He, yeah, my belief is he simply needs to follow the Constitution. He swore an oath four years ago to the Constitution of the United States, which very specifically proscribes what his duty is today. And my hope is that this will be the one moment, perhaps, that will define his legacy when he stands up to Donald Trump and adheres to the Constitution. Great. Uh, I echo that. Amen. <laughs> Great. Um, so we'll take our next question from uh, Malachi Barry with um, MLive. Uh, please unmute and uh, feel free to take off your camera. Uh, hopefully you can hear me, uh, if not see me. Um, following up on this idea that, you know, if, if there are electoral votes challenged today, uh, this will create, you know, serious harm, long lasting problems for our democracy in our country. I'd be interested in hearing more from some of the other reps about what we do to restore some 
faith, you know, in our institutions, um, you know, there's certainly a significant portion of the population that at this point, uh, you know, lacks faith that this election was conducted fairly, you know, kind of regardless of what happens today. Let's say you had your hand, do you want to respond? I mean, this is what I, what I was trying to express in my comments, that this idea that somehow, um, ho you know, hopefully we'll get through this day procedurally and per the constitution and we'll do a peaceful transition of power. But this idea from anyone that we can just ignore the other side is not viable, particularly in a state like Michigan, obviously particularly in a district like mine. Um, and I do think that Jocelyn Benson's offer to have a bipartisan deep dive and sort of after action report into the elections is the right thing to do so that people who believe we have enduring problems, who have been told that there's been um, something amiss with our, uh, with our electoral process can have the confidence that that isn't true. And they clearly have been getting that counter message, literally propaganda telling them that these weren't fair elections. Let's give them full transparency and visibility because uh, the, the prospect of Americans not believing in democracy is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous no matter what party you're from and where you are on the political spectrum because we are a diverse, complicated country. And if we don't all believe in this system and we start separating ourselves from it, um, it, it you can see how it becomes chaotic. And one of the things I'll just end on that I really feel like is certainly part of my job given my district, and I think we all feel this to some extent, um, is to use my convening power as a member of Congress to bring together groups who might not otherwise be in the same room. Um, we have to do this for many reasons, but that is how we start. And it, maybe not to talk politics, maybe to talk about saving our small businesses. But if we do not understand our role, all of us, in trying to bring our, our sort of country back, we are in trouble. Okay, I think Andy, you wanted to comment quickly before we go to uh -huh. the yeah, um, yeah, I just, I think the thing Malachi is about sort of threading a needle. Obviously, we don't want to, th there's no giving any sort of legitimacy to these, uh, you know, these claims about the election being, being problematic. But I really agree with Representative Slotkin here. I, I was talking to one of my Republican clerks, and I really think it's a question of education and really, tr and the transparency transparency and she was just like wearing me down my clerk with she told a story about one of her employees and the husband and the wife got their ballots wrong when they sent them in and they caught it and she told about all of the uh, redundant checks on ballots and it was just so tremendous and we just have to get out there after this and educate people very carefully about um you know what how it works what happened and why it was a totally free and fair election and i agree with representative slotkin it's an absolutely by question of bipartisanship and working together to get that done and i think you know my row you know row of the garden here is mostly macomb county there's a lot of people with a lot of suspicion and i really want to work to to uh, win over as many people as possible to have more faith in our democratic process but it can't be by you know, giving um, any legitimacy to completely specious claims. Thanks. So I have Brenda comment that we've got a lot of questions in the queue, so. so the, the main thing that I want us as colleagues as being members of the we have to pass the Voting Rights Act Amendment. If we are really serious about this, we should enact the law that protect voting rights, that ensure that uh, suppression of votes is not something we just talk about and say you shouldn't do, that it is the law. Okay, well, Timmy. Great, um, so the next uh, question we have is Nicholas Wu from uh, US Today. Uh, feel free to meet your line and uh, take care of camera, Nick. Great, uh, thanks so much for holding this. I guess uh, we already, talked a bit about um, what's coming with Georgia, but I, I had a question more about the, the nitty gritty, so to speak, of today's electoral college proceedings. Um, if Michigan doesn't come up, are any of you planning on speaking um, in response to objections about other states or has that still not been figured out? No, the, the way uh, we've been discussing this as a caucus and with many of us talking to the speaker, uh, we have uh, four managers essentially 
that will uh, participate on the floor of the House to provide the general defense uh, of the electoral votes. And then only if a state is challenged, will that state delegation and only that state delegation then uh, speak to defend the electoral votes of the state beyond the four managers uh, that, that have been working on this. And I think actually, because one of them who's been helping craft this was one of the tellers, there will really only be three uh, managers. So the, to the nitty gritty question, we will be prepared. We have a room reserved just off the floor. If in fact we uh, see a challenge to the state of Michigan, uh, we, the seven of us, or six of uh, Representative Tlaib is not up to it. Um, she's under the weather. But we will go to the floor and uh, offer our defense. Otherwise, um, it's not anticipated that uh, state delegations or any other members will, will uh, speak. Thank you. Great. Um, next, we have uh, Jordan Hermani with uh, Gongor. Uh, Gongor News, uh, feel free to uh, unmute your line. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, Two, perhaps three of your colleagues have signaled that they are going to contest uh, the results of the Electoral College votes. What do you have to say to them and how do you see your working relations with um, these individuals moving forward, given the fact that they have continued to push um, debunked claims of, of voting irregularity and voter fraud? I know my colleagues will all want to weigh in on this. We had a conversation this morning and I, I said, that I will view them differently from now on if they vote uh, to sustain uh, the challenges because it's such an egregious act that it's impossible for me to look at them the same way. Uh, my, my respect for them will be diminished. Others? Uh, go ahead. I, I just wanna say that each member of Congress is here because the people in their districts supported them and voted for them. Uh, the, one of the things that I, I feel strongly that once they make that commitment and perform the act of contesting, that their constituency will have a totally different picture of them as a representative of this, this, this democracy in our constitution and the oath of office that they took. Dan, you know, I feel like there's two aspects of leadership of, of, of being a member of the house. One is representing your district, trying to faithfully, you know, meet with them constantly and, and hear their voice and carry it into this house. And, and, and the other one is your moral judgment. They're choo choosing you because at the end of the day, you have to do what you think is right. This is gut check time, friends. Uh, you, th th this vote is either standing with the constitution or against it, standing within the realm of democracy or outside of it. And so I will end up um, remembering forever and just having to look at my colleagues differently if they vote to undermine their democracy, especially if it's because they feel like it's for the, their, their political you know, considerations require it. We have to vote our conscience. And if we lose an election, that's just the nature of this process. And we would hold our heads high for the rest of our lives for having done the right thing. And that's what, that's the nature of this vote. Yeah, it's certainly beyond the Warsaw test. Uh, this, is, this is about fact. Um, we recognize that Several years ago, the Pew Research Group uh, showed that we were at the lowest levels of trust ever in government. And these actions are certainly continuing to sow the distrust and the fracturing of um, our democracy, of which Congresswoman Dingell spoke about. And it is not something that we take lightly. I, I remain committed to bipartisan legislating and, and working together. Uh, but certainly these actions um, are, are, they lack courage and uh, there is an element to them that is, that is unforgivable. I'd like to comment on the, one, the Republican members of our delegation who are under enormous pressure. Uh, they uh, 
have had death threats. They have had uh, uh, unrelenting calls to their office, but they are, Fred Upton has been a leader in his Republican caucus about what is right, but a number of our other colleagues uh, are doing what they think is right. And I, even Lisa has not yet said what she's gonna do. And I wanna really caution everybody till she does vote, we don't know uh, what she's doing. And I think they, uh, know, they are very mindful of what their responsibility is. And quite frankly, even our Republican state legislative leaders uh, who were also under enormous pressure. Yeah, and I, I will just say that um, Congresswoman Dingell and I um, are in the Problem Solvers Caucus, and we just put out a joint statement earlier this, this morning with our Republican colleagues, Fred Upton being one of them. But I really want to um, uh, highlight Peter Meyer as well. This is his first week in Congress, and he is having to take these kinds of votes. Um, and I applaud him for also being a real voice in support of, of Michigan elections. So I think it's important. I will just say, and, and um, I've had a lot of my um, Republican colleagues sort of um, tell me about the pressure that they're under and um, threats and that militias are forming and, and all of these things. And I must say, um, it has been hard um, to hear some of their comments because it feels so familiar. Um, and many of us on the screen have been living with this for a long time. Um, and um, you know, to my colleagues who are sort of surfing the wave of populism and doing this because they think it solidifies their hold over their base, um, I find it just absolutely um, disgusting. And um, I, I think they're starting to realize what it feels like when they can no longer surf that wave and the curl of the wave is coming down at them, um, uh, how anti-democratic and horrible it feels to watch your country go through that. And so I'm sorry, I never want anyone to go through that, um, but there has been a leadership vacuum that has led to this moment that has allowed the situation where our politics have come down to violence and militias and threats instead of having real conversation across the aisle. And we are all, as leaders, um, part of that conversation and have shared responsibility for that. Okay, well, Timmy. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, Jonathan Osting with uh, Bridge, uh, Bridge Media, Michigan. Uh, feel free to unmute your line, Jonathan. Yeah. Hey, thanks, everybody. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. I'm wearing a winter hat and not uh, presentable right now. Uh, in any case, um, just wanted to ask real quick, uh, Republicans are saying, well, Democrats have objected before. I think in 2004, there was an objection uh, from Barbara Boxer and, and, and a, a congresswoman uh, to the results that year. How is this year uh, different than um, what happened in 2004? It, it is true, and this question has come up. Uh, those, and I've uh, seen the comments by uh, former Senator Boxer on this question. Uh, there have been occasions when objections have been used as a mechanism to raise a question, to raise a point. For example, about some of the anti-democratic uh, uh, poll activity that took place in the state of Ohio, for example, which was one of the reasons that it was raised. But it was always done with the clear intent, explicit intent, to serve as a venue or a vehicle to raise a question, a rhetorical question, to daylight and highlight a problem. This is completely different. There's no equivalency when you have literally hundreds of members of Congress, over 100 members of Congress and a dozen senators and the president of the United States whipping up public opinion with the idea that they are going to succeed in overturning the will of the people. Never in the past have these objections been used or even suggested that the outcome should be challenged or overturned, but was used as an appropriate mechanism to raise a question, to call attention to a real problem and done with dignity, respect and grace, as opposed to what we see right now, literally members of Congress and the president of the United States conspiring to overturn a democratic election. There's no equivalency whatsoever. Thanks. 
Next question. Uh, we're going to go with uh, Craig Mauger with uh, Detroit News. Uh, Craig, feel free to answer. Hey, thanks for letting me ask a question. Um, I'm curious, uh, Representative Kildee, you said the Michigan delegation, quote, will be prepared to defend defend the state's vote if it's challenged. Can you provide a little bit more information on, on what that might look like and what preparations you all have taken to get ready for this? It sounds like you've spoke, a lot of you have spoken with local clerks and thanks for letting me ask a question again. Sure, and I'll open it up to my colleagues because we've all been doing this as a team. Uh, a couple of days ago, we met with the speaker, uh, the chair of the House Administration Committee uh, and two other uh, members of the House uh, Democratic Caucus that will lead the overall defense. And we spent a, a good deal of time with them on developing what we thought is a practical strategy. And then the seven of us Democrats have now met three times uh, over a number of hours to, uh, to craft our defense. It's divided uh, you know, in six or seven parts. Um, uh, we have five minutes each if in fact our state is challenged. And so, you know, in order to coordinate our message to make sure we cover all of the points, I don't think I want to get ahead of what our message will be on the floor, but suffice to say what you've heard each of us recite today in the opening remarks of this uh, media event uh, is, is fairly similar to what you'll hear if we are in fact placed on the floor. But we felt it was really important that Michigan have a coherent, united, defense. And it's also possible that Republican uh, members will seek time as the speaker alternates between Democrats and Republicans speaking on the floor. If uh, It's possible that Republican members may as well address. But we felt, the seven of us felt, that we needed to stand strong and defend the state of Michigan and have come up with what we think is uh, a defense that we're, we're proud of. Um, We'll put our statements out when we make them uh, on the floor of the House uh, later today. And if we are not called upon, then we will release those um, statements for you at that point. Others? Uh, I just wanted to say we prepared, but we lived through this, you know, real time. Each of us were challenged in our districts to validate that we were following procedures to answer those concerns, to go to the mic, to go to the voting polls. Uh, I know I was all day long at voting uh, polls to validate that procedures are running, check in on the procedures. All of us have done this. So we lived real time through these allegations and working with a um, state Secretary of State that has been amazing and open and responsive whenever we had any challenges. I One of the things we haven't talked a lot about are the absentee ballots. I, I sit on government oversight, a 30 year retired postal employee and I stayed on top of talking to the postmaster general, the local postmasters to find out where the ballots were and that we were moving them through the system. So we're prepared. Uh, we just had to put it in writing, but I have to say our delegation, we work very closely together to monitor this because we are committed to a safe, secure and accessible election. And can I just add real quickly, Craig, in terms of the practicality of your question, if there's an objection to a state, as I think you know, it's in a joint session, then the two houses split, the House and the Senate each go to our own chambers, there's up to two hours of debate. So we'll be there, to, you know, carrying out the debate for Michigan, but after each one of those that happens, each House votes on the objection and that is the actual defense of the integrity of Michigan's election. And there is no question that the House will vote against any of these spurious challenges. And therefore, since both houses would, and the Senate will vote against it too, actually. So that's what will actually kill the objections in, for any state that is raised. And then we come back together and start going through the alphabet again in the joint session. Craig, I would just like to add to both what Andy and Brenda said. We didn't have to get ready this week. We, you've got a delegation on the Democratic side that is very engaged. 
uh, I, I, we all called, I mean, from the very moment that AVs, I called the clerks and every one of my districts every week. Uh, we were examining, listening to people available, doing town halls. We are a delegation that works with the people that we represent. All we did this week was to take the data that we knew in our hearts and why we know that we had a legitimate and safe election in the state of Michigan because we were part of ensuring that that's exactly what happened. Well said. Right. Next question. Uh, we can go with um, Larry Sproul from uh, WDIB Detroit. Um, feel free to unmute your line, Larry. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Just real quick, um, just for maybe one of the representatives. Um, moving forward, can we move forward as a state with Democrats and Republicans? Can we all work together moving forward? And what's next? We must. We don't have a choice. The people of Michigan expect us to get our job done, and that means we've got to work together to solve their problems. I mean, I'll be candid. I reached out to Mike Shirky yesterday and said, Mike, Fred and I want to meet with you regularly. I want to, uh, uh, we need to talk to everybody. We need to understand what the issues are. People, I, I, you want to know something? I think Donald Trump got elected four years ago. I said this at the time because people were tired of bipartisan bickering and they wanted to shake things up. Well, they shook it up more than they wanted. I think the America, that Michiganders expect us to work together. They want us to work together and we must work together. None of that. Timmy? Great, next question. Uh, we have Sam with uh, MIRS News. Uh, Sam, feel free to unmute your line. Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Representative Levin talked about Proposal 3 of 2018 that made voting more accessible. What does the battle look like in 2021 for continuing to make voting more accessible? And how do you strategize to open and safeguard doors of, to voting in the age of the disenfranchised voter? Andy, you want to lead on that since you referenced your comment? Sure. Um, great question, Sam. Well, I certainly agree with Representative Lawrence that we have to pass the Voting Rights Act improvements and, and our HR1 package. So that's one thing. But I, I just want to reiterate how proud I am of the progress we've made. You know, we also passed uh, Proposal 2. And so we're going to have an unprecedented new system of nonpartisan redistricting that's fantastic for our democracy. Our districts almost for sure won't look all crazy quilt and wrapping around each other, but there'll be sensible blocks that keep communities of interest together. Um, there are other improvements that I didn't reference in uh, from Promote the Vote that are also working, like that you're automatically registered or you're voter file is updated each time you conduct a transaction with the Secretary of State's office unless you object to it, which almost no one does. So I think that Michigan's going really in the right direction in terms of the sort of health of our voting processes. And I'm really proud of that. And I think we'll continue it. And then this level of dissension politically is sort of on top of that, it's a, it's a different question. And I think it's gonna help that question by continuing to talk together in a bipartisan way and educate everybody about the strength of, our, of, of, of the infrastructure of our democracy in Michigan, because we're really going in the correct direction on that. And that's something to celebrate. Do we aim to end at noon? Uh, well, Jimmy, do we have any more questions? Yeah, we have uh, one more. This will be the uh, last question. Uh, Mark Havitt with the uh, Oakland uh, Press. Uh, feel free to uh, unmute your line, Mark. Yes, good morning, and thank you for taking my question. All of you agree that the elections were conducted safely, securely, and run, and were an uh, accurate reflection of the will of the voters. With statements from incredible evidence presented by uh, federal, state, and local election officials showing that to be true, I'd like to get your thoughts on what may be some of the core motivating factors um, that have prompted some Republicans to object to the vote today. Is it to overturn the election results or is it purely political? I wanna say it's, it's politics. They will tell you this is about protecting the, the base that is supportive of the lies that Donald Trump has said. It's unfortunate because when you take an oath of office, you don't say I pledge to serve the 
any party or any president. It says the people of this great country. It is so, this has been the greatest hardship of all of this. I, I love politics. I love the game of it. I love the push and pull. But when you have something that's based on lies, something that is based on divisiveness, it is heartbreaking because our democracy only works when that leg of the people with their right to vote is strong and this has gone after that leg. And so that's why you heard the comment from Debbie Dingle, but this is, this is uh, very uncomfortable right now because we're kind of swaying because that, that's what this whole process is going after that because we have our legislative branch, we have our judicial branch, but our democracy to vote is it rests on the people. And this is this movement has been directly to misinform, to inflict fear in the people of America and our democracy. And so that's why we are so together on this and we're fighting for this and we're not alone. We do have some Republicans on our side, a few, but we have them and we're gonna tighten that leg up and move forward, pass laws that will eliminate this from happening again, hopefully. But democracy is a living and breathing thing. You have to feed it, you have to protect it, and you have to ensure that no one, no one has the right or the ability to destroy it. It's a really, it's a really important question because I think it starts with Donald Trump, President Trump, who has initiated all of this. We can't read his mind uh, other than my belief that, you know, he's a, a person with sociopathic tendencies and only believes things that are in his interest, even if they're not true. But the most cynical aspect of this is that for most of the uh, members of the House and Senate that are participating in this, uh, it's really a cynical use of their public platform because they know that this will not succeed. And in fact, many of them, and many of us have talked to some of these individuals, they know that what's being asserted is not true. They also know that the people who are being whipped up, including those people that Congresswoman Slotkin saw uh, this morning out on the mall, they do believe it. These members of the House and Senate are taking advantage of these individuals, taking advantage in a very cynical way to persuade them of something that they themselves know to be a falsehood. That is not leadership. That's immoral. Great. Thank you so much, Congressman Kildee. Um, I think that's, uh, those are all the questions we have. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, that is all, and I really appreciate everyone for joining this call. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. How about Bye -bye. Joe? Thank you.